I'm joined today by Dr. Martin Gabala, PhD, a professor and chair of McMaster Department of Kinesiology. His research on the physiological and health benefits of high-intensity interval training has attracted immense scientific attention and worldwide media coverage. Dr. Gabala has authored over 100 peer-reviewed articles, the results of which have been featured by outlets including the New York Times, CNN, and Time Magazine. His first book, The One Minute Workout, focuses on the science of time-efficient exercise, was recently published by Penguin Random House. Dr. Gabala has received three awards for teaching excellence at McMaster, as well as the President's Award for Excellence in Graduate Student Supervision. Martin, thanks so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule. Really appreciate you joining us today. Thanks for the opportunity to be on. Terrific. Well, before we dive into all the amazing complexities, uh, efficacy, and simplicity of HIT training, can you uh, tell the listeners a little bit about how you got started down this road into researching uh, interval and high-intensity interval training? Uh, sure. So I, I've been at McMaster since uh, 1999, and you know, in the early uh, 2000s, I was a young, busy assistant professor. My wife's a working teacher, two young kids, and so quite ironic. Ironically, for a professor of exercise physiology, I found myself very time pressed with limited time to exercise. And at the same time, I teach a course called the Integrative Physiology of Human Performance. And the students are always interested in the training regimes of elite athletes, in particular elite endurance athletes. And they would ask me, why do these athletes uh, train using these short, hard intervals for aerobic type events? And so I sort of put two and two together and thought, you know, maybe there's something there. And so that sort of led to a personal and professional interest in interval training that's uh, lasted almost 15 years or so. Oh, fantastic. I mean, there's so much incredible stuff coming out of your research lab and around uh, the world on the benefits of interval-based training. Now, for all the docs and nutritionists and strength coaches and just avid uh, exercisers in the, in the audience listening, can you, can you give us a bit of a physiology 101 on, on what exactly is going on uh, during the HIIT training in terms of you know the energy systems involved, ATP, et cetera? Yeah, so I, I think a lot of people have this notion. Oh, so first point is that interval training comes in lots of different flavors and varieties. And so simply defined, interval training is just periods of relatively intense exercise separated by periods of recovery. That, of course, could be complete rest or lower intensity exercise. And so that impacts a little bit on the energy systems that you use. So if you do interval walking, for example, that's very different from the one-minute workout, which is very short but very vigorous all-out sprint. So I guess that would be point number one. Uh, point number two is a lot of people think that interval training is largely a quote-unquote anaerobic type of exercise. You know, we think of 400-meter repeats, uh, and, you know, that generates a lot of lactic acid and a lot of pain and discomfort. Uh, and the sense is that it's not much of an aerobic training stimulus when, in fact, it very much is. And so repeated sprints are mainly fueled by aerobic energy provision. So if even if you do a single 400 meter repeat, for example, around a track that might take, you know, a, a relatively good individual, maybe uh, 50 or 60 seconds to complete, um, even during that single hard sprint, probably about 25% of the energy is coming from aerobic metabolism. But if you were to do repeated 400 meter sprints, um, the vast majority of energy is coming from aerobic metabolism. So viewed in that prism, it's perhaps not surprising that we have such extensive remodeling of the aerobic energy supply system. And what I mean there is the heart becomes a better, stronger pump. The blood vessels get more elastic, which allows blood and oxygen to flow easier. And the muscles get better at using the oxygen. They literally develop and grow more mitochondria, which is the important part of the cell that uses oxygen to burn fuels like sugars and fats. Terrific. And of course, you know, in terms of measuring fitness, traditionally, you know, aerobic fitness is measured by, you know, VO2 max and, and, and classic aerobic training is how we would build up to a improving VO2 max. So can you, can you tell us how, you know, HIIT training um, relates to, is it possible to improve VO2 max via performing HIIT training? And, uh, you know, is, is VO2 max a modifiable factor? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, VO2 max is a modifiable factor. Of course, it is defined as the maximum rate at which the body can take up and utilize oxygen, primarily determined by the ability of the heart uh, to deliver oxygen to, to working muscles. Uh, it's a bit like a mortgage. There's a fixed element and a variable component to it. The fixed element largely depends on things like uh, your biological sex uh, and your genetic capacity for adaptation. 
Um, but there's also uh, a variable element as well, which is largely determined by training state. And so uh, a component of VO2 max is clearly modifiable through training, and we can uh, improve it uh, by exercise uh, training. As you noted, the traditional way to do that is uh, aerobic or traditional endurance type exercise, but we know that intervals can be extremely effective. And so I'm often asked, how does interval training compare to traditional endurance training when it comes to VO2 max or any other parameter for that matter? And I'll often try to reframe the question and say, well, there's two ways to look at it. The apples to apples approach uh, would be if you were to compare a given dose of exercise, so whether that's mechanical work or a given amount of uh, calories expended or a given amount of energy expenditure, um, but you do that matched work comparison, I think there's pretty compelling data now that interval training will elicit superior benefits. That's certainly the case for VO2 max. A lot of people, of course, are interested in the apples to oranges comparison, which is if we take a relatively small dose of intervals or a small volume of intervals, how does that compare to a much larger dose of the traditional approach? And I think there's good evidence there to suggest that you can see similar benefits uh, even though the interval training involves less total exercise and and less of a time commitment. But, you know, we could talk about some very specific examples to make both of those points, if you like. For sure, yeah. I mean, we'll definitely get into some of the protocols as we go forward. Now, you mentioned in, in the book, obviously, PGC1-alpha is this sort of master regulator. Can you discuss how, you know, the, the role of that and how it's uh, allowing for some of these adaptations to take place? Yeah, sure. So PGC1-alpha is just a protein in muscle. It's called a transcriptional coactivator. It's it's very important in uh, inducing mitochondrial biogenesis or literally creating uh, more, more mitochondria. You know, people might remember from their high school or university textbooks, and they think of mitochondria as these two-dimensional bean-shaped structures, where in reality, it's it's a much more elegant structure than that. It's almost like a, a capillary network. And so when we talk about uh, mitochondrial biogenesis, really what we're talking about is expansion of an existing network. You could think of a, a garden hose literally growing more um, uh, you know, uh, growing uh, larger in, in, in size and developing uh, more tubes, if you will. That's really what mitochondrial biogenesis uh, entails. And PGC1-alpha is a very important protein that uh, coordinates that process. And so it's often deemed the master regulator uh, because it's such an important protein and it um, is involved in the activation of many different other proteins that are all involved in mitochondrial biogenesis. And so, for example, in our lab, we've been interested in PGT1-alpha, and we've shown that these short, hard bursts of interval exercise can elicit the same activation or increase in PGT1-alpha as we normally see with uh, a much larger amount of traditional endurance-type exercise. And that's uh, obviously a major point in this whole story is the idea that in, in far less time we can induce some incredible adaptations, whether for the average folks trying to improve their health or even in, you know, athletes. And, you know, in your book, you mentioned the evolutionary context. And I recently had uh, Dr. Stefan Guillenet on, who's a neuroscientist and obesity expert. He mentioned how we're sort of driven, the body and brain are driven to seek out calorically dense foods. And, of course, in your book, you mentioned the Harvard paleoanthropologist, Dr. Daniel Lieberman, who also describes this idea of, you know, humans evolving to avoid exercise exercise. And I know a lot of people say, well, I just don't like longer bouts of exercise. And of course, it seems like this could be just an inherent um, evolutionary adaptation, no? To want to conserve? Uh, yeah, it could be. You know, it was uh, also pointed out by uh, Alan Batterham, who we um, interviewed for the book, who's uh, an exercise physiologist at Teesside University in the UK. And, uh, you know, Alan made the um, insightful point that there's no real biological drive to exercise, not like, for example, a biological drive to consume food or to have sex, for example. Uh, there's not that seeming innate biological drive to demand that we be uh, physically active. And, and so, you know, given um, our Western society today and how we've largely tried to engineer physical activity out of our lives, we're, we're seeing the manifestations uh, of, of that. But I, I think there's certainly some important evolutionary principles at, at play, you know, to, to draw the con to that. Um, maybe one of the reasons that some people uh, might like interval training more is it resembles more natural play. So if you watch children in a playground, they don't sort of jog in place for 45 minutes at a moderate pace. They run and hop and skip and jump. And so there's a, a school of thought from behavior perspective that at least for some people they might enjoy this type of exercise more because it more resembles natural play absolutely i mean i know a lot of clients even just the term 
exercise isn't, isn't a motivating thing for a lot of them. It can be almost a scary thing if they're overweight or uh, high blood sugars, pre-diabetic, et cetera. So that concept of play is, uh, is, is really, really key. Um, now, if we shift gears in terms of, you know, talking about high intensity interval training, this isn't actually a sort of a new thing, is it? I mean, this has been around for, for hundreds of years, early Olympians, um, this style of training, even Roger, Roger Bannister breaking the four minute mile. Can you talk a little bit about the history of, of hit training with some of the athletes and Olympians? Yeah, absolutely. And the more I'm um, involved in this line of research, the more I appreciate both the athletic history and the scientific history of interval training. Uh, you're right, it goes back at least 100 years uh, near the turn of the century. There were Finnish Olympians winning Olympic uh, middle distance gold medals, uh, training almost exclusively using short, hard intervals. Um, you mentioned Roger Bannister, who was a very busy medical student as he was uh, about to make the assault on the four minute mile. And, and so, you know, he trained almost exclusively on his lunch hours uh, using basically 400 uh, meter repeats uh, around a track. And so if you look at the athletic history, you can see sort of interval training come in and out of flavor. Um, you know, sometimes it's periods of high volume training. Sometimes it's periods of high intensity training uh, come, come into play. The scientific history of interval training dates back to at least the 1950s with some German publications. First English language publication was in 1960. And then again, you see the same sort of thing where it comes into play uh, for a while. Um, obviously, Tabata style interval training um, was based on a paper out of Japan in uh, the mid 1990s. And then it lays dormant for a little bit. And then probably since about 2005, there's been a, a massive upsurge as well. You know, I, I think what we've learned a lot over the last 10 or 15 years or so is, number one, just the surprisingly time efficiency of interval exercise. So how low can you go? Uh, and the idea that if you're willing and able to do these very short, very hard bursts of exercise, uh, you can see adaptations with a very surprising small volume of exercise. That'd be point number one. And point number two is just the... Um, the wide variety of interval training protocols that have been applied to so many different individuals, including cardiovascular disease patients, people with type 2 diabetes, um, metabolic syndrome, and, and other conditions. And so I think we've learned a lot about the potential application of different types of interval training uh, to these uh, non-healthy individuals. Yeah, it's incredible. I mean, as a boots on the ground clinician here, diet and exercise for me are sort of fundamental components of my practice. And, you know, in your book, I love the quote, you say, you know, we spend billions of dollars a year on research to create pills and improve health. Most of the pills ta target one area of health and have unwanted side effects. Meanwhile, the most powerful intervention possible, which is exercise, goes comparatively unutilized. And I, I think that's definitely rings true with a lot of the clients that I see in terms of uh, being able to dovetail in and drip feed in exercise. And the the response you get when people realize that they don't need this huge dose of exercise. So could you speak, you mentioned there a little bit in terms of uh, the impacts on heart. I know the Copenhagen heart study was, was pretty influential there and also on uh, hyperinsulinemias and diabetes. Uh, yeah, both of those areas, um, interval exercise has been uh, widely applied now. So there's work going back again, back uh, to uh, Germany in the late 80s and, and early 90s. Uh, there was a medical doctor there named uh, Katarina Meyer who is employing uh, intense interval exercise. And when I say intense interval exercise, we're talking one minute repeats at a heart rate of about 90% of maximum in a cardiac rehabilitation uh, setting. And over time, that work has continued. There's a lot of work uh, being done in Norway now using a, a protocol that we call the Norwegian, uh, which is just four four minute bursts of uh, effort, again, at about 90, 85 or 90% of, of maximal heart rate in a cardiac rehabilitation setting. Uh, we've done some small proof of principle studies on individuals with diabetes. So these would be obese individuals in their 60s uh, performing exercise at about 90% of maximal heart rate. Um, and there was just a, a meta-analysis that was published last year uh, that suggested that interval exercise is superior at improving uh, various indices of, of insulin uh, sensitivity. So again, I don't think there's any question now that interval exercise can be applied to these populations and can be very effective. Uh, that's not to say that this type of training is for everyone. Um, you know, we're doing a study right now with uh, type 2 diabetics, uh, and obviously all of them undergo an exercise stress test before they're recruited into the study. And a few individuals are identified who are not 
suited uh, for vigorous exercise, or at least they're not initially cleared by the cardiologist because something shows up on the exercise stress test. So, you know, obviously you want to be smart. Uh, you want to see your physician before you start or change an exercise uh, regime. Um, but in the big picture, people don't need to be afraid of interval training. And I like to think that there's a, a flavor or a variety uh, that's suitable for just about anyone. Absolutely. I mean, you mentioned this idea of obviously intensity over duration being so key. And, and what struck me with the Copenhagen Heart Study was the fact that people who walked a lot, we always assume, a, you know, getting lots of walking in and movement in is something that I encourage and generally we encourage people to do. Um, but of course, as you get towards the top of that bell curve, you know, it doesn't seem like more is better from what we see in, in the study here in terms of the intensity, the speed at which people are walking is actually a, a much better predictor. Uh, you're right. And so, you know, big picture, of course, getting people moving is important. And so if, if people are already walking, good on you, fantastic, because I think that's half the battle is just getting people doing some sort of physical activity. And that's, of course, where we see the greatest reduction in mortality risk and cardiovascular disease risk. But if you're already being active, then I think it's important to push the pace once in a while. Uh, there's a randomized, small, but uh, randomized clinical trial out of Denmark that looked at interval walking compared to continuous steady state walking in both groups it was relatively gentle interval exercise the peak heart rates were around 66 percent of maximum on average but what that study clearly showed was that interval walking was superior to continuous steady state walking in terms of boosting cardiorespiratory fitness uh, reducing blood fat uh, and uh, body fat and importantly improving blood sugar over 24 hours. And so the very simple practical takeaway there was uh, if you're doing walking, that's great, but uh, interval walking is probably better in terms of the benefits that it can be uh, induced. Yeah, again, it's incredible with, um, you know, in America, one out of two people are pre-diabetic or diabetic. In Canada, we're not too far behind. Um, and so it's amazing. Uh, it seems like this should just be first-line therapy um, in terms of education at medical schools and whatnot in terms of exercise uh, interventions because it's, it's wide-ranging in terms of heart and, and, and blood sugar response. Now, that said, on the fat-burning side of things, if people want to also get leaner and lose weight, uh, what's going on in terms of the effects of HIT on, 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 on fat-burning and, and being able to shed some unwanted pounds? Yeah, two thoughts. Uh, the, the first is obviously it's much easier to control the energy inside of the equation and what we put in our mouth and whether it's 90-10 or whether it's 80-20 in terms of control by diet and control by by. Ex- exercise, clearly the the more important consideration there is the nutrition uh, element. That being said, uh, we know that exercise can be effective at at least helping to maintain weight loss over the long term. And there's clear evidence that intervals are a time efficient way to burn calories. Personal trainers will talk about the afterburn effect or this idea of a heightened rate of calorie burning or metabolism uh, in recovery. Uh, It's often overstated, but it's a real effect. And we've shown in our lab, for example, that a 20 minute session of interval results in the same calorie burn uh, as a 50 five zero minute uh, period of, of continuous exercise. So uh, it can play a role. It is a time efficient way to burn calories, but I think the uh, magnitude of the effect is, is overstated sometimes. Gotcha. I mean, I know the general recommendations for people to exercise, you know, we're up to about 150 minutes per week. Most people just don't get there. I mean, I can't recall off the top of my head if it's 15 or 20 percent of people actually getting that much exercise in. So this idea of being more efficient with the exercise is uh, seems like an absolute no brainer. It, you know, it does. When you look at 150 minutes per week, that's only about 2% of the time in our week. I, you know, I think it's clearly an excuse for, for some people, but a lot of people lead very busy time press lives and, and find it challenging to, uh, to work this in. Uh, you know, I often say that the public health guidelines are based on great science. And so this is not at all an effort to challenge the public health guidelines or pitch this as an interval versus the traditional approach. But as you say, depending on the study, 15, 20, 25 percent adherence to public health guidelines. And so really, I think we need to be providing people with other menu choices, other exercise options. Uh, When I talk to my behavioral colleagues, uh, that's the point that they make. You know, the more options we can give people, the better. And so I think the lessons from interval training are, are one, you know, if you don't have 45 minutes or an hour block of time in the day, that's all right. You know, you can get in a, a 10 minute bout of activity uh, simply by taking the stairs at work. And as you know, simple as that sounds, it can be extremely effective. And we're, we're increasingly learning more about this idea of exercise snacking. 
uh, which is just breaking up physical activity into more frequent, shorter bouts through the day. And there's uh, evidence to suggest that that actually may be superior in terms of blood sugar control, blood pressure control, as opposed to a single longer continuous bout of exercise uh, done all at once. And so I think intervals provide more options to fit exercise within your day and within your life rather than having to structure your life around exercise. Absolutely. And just like you mentioned, you know, as, as people are getting busier in their lives or if they have kids at home, all of a sudden the hours in the day start to dwindle down in terms of that available time. Um, you touched on something really key there that on the behavioral side. Oftentimes people, again, think are perhaps intimidated by intervals or have this idea of them um, as being too intense for them. Uh, but in your in your book, you, you mentioned some of the research around um the impacts on behavior and, and what people actually choose in terms of their preferred exercise choice um, favoring sort of some of this hit uh, type stuff. Could you, could you speak to that a little bit? Sure. And for sure, this is a controversial topic, the whole potential of interval training for, for public health. And there's one school of thought, I would call it the more traditional approach that says, you know, if the more intense the exercise, the more uncomfortable it feels and the less likely people are to do it because they find it aversive. And so they won't be motivated to continue exercising because they find it uncomfortable. But there's a whole uh, another side to that. And um, many behavioral and health psychology researchers now are saying, well, wait a minute, continuous vigorous exercise is very different from intermittent vigorous exercise. And clearly, uh, a number of people are, are more than willing to make that trade off where they might be able to get away with less total exercise, even though the exercise itself is more uncomfortable uh, when they're actually uh, doing it. I think it comes back to the idea of individual differences. Um, some people are going to like interval training and some people aren't, and that's okay. But rather than tell people there's only one approach and that's the traditional 150 minutes of continuous exercise, again, let's give people more, more options to choose from uh, because we just have to look at those adherence guidelines. And right now they're, they're, they're pretty poor. Uh, and so if we can even find, you know, five or 10% of individuals who might prefer and be more likely to adopt interval training, you know, you do the math in terms of healthcare savings and public health uh, savings, and, and it's enormous. A hundred percent. I mean, definitely in clinical practice, when I start using some of these approaches with my clients who are, you know, unfit, out of shape, even those who are fit, I mean, it's just people are surprised at how much gains that they can make with, with limited um, minimal effort or time investment. So that's a, it's a massive, massive piece. And, and of course, this brings us to the question all about protocols, what people want to know, what kind of routines or things to, to introduce into their exercise regimes. Can you, can you walk us through sort of some of the initial, if someone is, let's say, more you know, out of shape, overweight, um, you know, where would a place to start for them in terms of interval training? Yeah, I talked about that beginner workout earlier, which is really just this idea of interval walking. That's a great place to start. And, and so, you know, it's a very simple message. But if your only exercise is walking around the block, that's basically picking up the pace for a few light posts and then backing off and, and just getting out of your comfort zone, you know, based on perceived exertion. You don't have to be sprinting by any means, just picking up the pace a little bit. So maybe it's a little harder to talk to your exercise uh, partner. You can feel your uh, a little bit more out of breath, maybe your heart rate's up uh, a little bit, just get out of your comfort zone and then back off. And that's a really easy way to start. Um, of course, you know, there's lots of fitness apps and things like that. Now people can really dial it in in terms of trying to measure percentages of maximal heart rate, but uh, we're big on just perceived exertion. And so in the book, we try to anchor all of the workouts to uh, a very simple uh, one to 10 scale, which is, you know, based on some classic research by a fellow named uh, Borg. You're, some of your listeners, I'm sure, are familiar with the, the Borg perceived exertion scale, where this idea of one is a very easy or resting pace. 10 is all out maximum, like you might sprint to save your child from an oncoming car. And so interval walking might be around a three out of 10. That's the type of, of pace that you might demand. Uh, and then in the book, we basically lay out a series of workouts, uh, the 10 by one, for example, that's that one minute relatively intense pace and then a minute of recovery. Maybe that's done at a five out of six out of 10. And then of course you work up to these more intense flavors where you're really going hard or trying to come close to a 10 out of 10, but maybe only for about 20 seconds at a time. So you can really scale these workouts, I think, to any starting level of fitness and based on our own uh, perception of effort. And in terms of the workouts themselves, there's a lot of variety, correct? In terms of using a bike or, or running or, or rowing, you can, uh, you know, the flavor or the variety is really up to the individual, right? 
Yeah, I think for, you know, big picture, you're, you know, there's a, a, a saying that your heart doesn't know what your muscles are doing. So from a cardiovascular conditioning standpoint, I don't think it matters whether you're doing running, cycling, stair climbing, swimming, rowing, elliptical. Uh, again, find an exercise that you like and enjoy because you're more likely to, to stick with it. Um, and, you know, if you're someone who is uh, over weight, maybe you're older, might be some musculoskeletal or joint or impact issues that you're worried about, uh, then of course, less weight bearing activities are going to be more suited for you. Maybe recumbent cycling, uh, as opposed to, uh, stair climbing or, or, or certainly on the flat running. So, uh, from a cardiovascular conditioning standpoint, I really don't think it matters. Uh, interval training can be applied in a body weight style manner as well. Uh, you don't need much space or specialized equipment. So we're talking, uh, burpees, um, mountain climbers, air squats, things like that, I call them hotel room workouts, can be extremely effective at at least maintaining and ideally boosting cardiorespiratory fitness, but also getting a, a muscle strengthening effect uh, as well. We'll come back to this idea, there's infinite variety there uh, in terms of the, the nature of the workouts, uh, the length of the uh, uh, workouts themselves in terms of the intervals and the recovery periods as well. And I think that goes to uh, potentially the, the long-term motivation, adherence, enjoyment. There's only so many ways you can jump on a treadmill and jog at a moderate pace for 45 minutes or an hour, but with intervals, the uh, variety is almost infinite. Absolutely. And, you know, for yourself, if, we, if you're traveling or at home, are there any, um, you know, f- favorite routines or ones that you tend to fall back on that, uh, that you find effective and enjoyable? You know, I, so pretty much, you know, I, I'm pr- probably like some of your listeners, I'm highly motivated to exercise. I know it works. And so, you know, I typically train about 30 minutes every day and I alternate uh, body weight style uh, resistance exercise with some traditional weightlifting. Uh, and then my go-to cardio exercise is, is cycling. Now in the winter, that's typically uh, on a stationary bike in my basement and then it's outside, uh, you know, during the nicer uh, weather. And I, you know, I, I play hockey uh, once a week as well. So that's something that fits into my lifestyle. It, it works for me. I don't go to the gym anymore because I have a, you know, decent setup in the, in the basement. It's nothing fancy. It, you know, it's like the uh, garage style gyms that you'll see pretty uh, low, low tech in that, but it's, it's, it's quite effective. Um, and I think comes back to this idea, do what works for you. Find an exercise that you like and enjoy because you're more likely to stick with it over the long term. Um, and variety tends to be good. You know, some of us, uh, you know, I, I like cycling and, and so I have no problem cycling as my primary form of cardio, but for other people, they would get bored on a bike. And so for them, variety is very, very important important and cross training is important. So again, it's highly individualized, but find something you like and enjoy and stick with it. Uh, absolutely. Great advice. Um, and for yourself, in terms of the bike, any, any recommendations on the bikes or the ones that you guys use in the lab or, or, or what do you, uh, yeah, we have a whole bunch. I have an old refurbished life cycle in, in my basement. The, the one thing that I like is, um, as long as I can, uh, determine workload. So any bike for me, I like to have a wattage setting on it. So I, I know exactly uh, where I am on the bike. And so for example, a go-to workout for me are five, five minute repeats at uh, 250 watts with one minute of recovery. So that's a, a half an hour workout start to finish. I get in about uh, 25 uh, minutes at a load of 250 watts, which is a decent push uh, for me. And so as long as I know wattage, I, I know I'm in about the right spot. Um, often I'll measure heart rate just cause I like the objective, uh, feedback, but again, there's nothing special about a particular bike in the lab. We have uh, $30,000, uh, high end cycle ergometers, uh, that we use for testing. And we have, uh, you know, relatively cheaper bikes of, uh, maybe $2,000 or so that we use for our training, but there's the old saying, the worse, the bike, the better the workout. And so, you know, lots <laughs> of these good. bikes that you tend to see in at garage uh, sales or, uh, on the curb, uh, some of those can provide a really effective workout. They're not very fancy, but, uh, you can work pretty hard on them. So I don't think it matters the bike. Terrific. Yeah. yeah and definitely the Watts is such a key indicator. I know in, in previously teaching spin classes and whatnot, that's always a, people have this, um, belief that, that their legs are moving quickly on a bike, that they're working hard. So that's definitely, uh, you know, getting the Watts on there, some tension on there is definitely, definitely key. Now, you mentioned before about this idea of how low can you go. Now, how, you know, even if people are, you know, one set or running for the bus or, or you know, how low can people go in terms of sprinkling in some interval training into their into their routine? Yeah, a few ways to answer that. Let me make the first point that we know from epidemiological studies that even a singly, single weekly bout of high intensity exercise is protective in terms of uh reducing risk for cardiovascular disease and uh, lowering uh, all-cause 
uh, risk of death or all-cause mortality. You know, sometimes, especially in Canada, we will see these uh, often high-profile media reports of uh, tragic incidents where, you know, the individual who plays in a beer league hockey game uh, drops dead, uh, and it's often, you know, the exercise is blamed. And clearly, it's it's tragic for that person, and probably there is other some sort of underlying uh, silent uh, heart disease uh, that may have been picked up with an exercise stress test. And so on an individual, that's why you very much need to be, I think, uh, evaluated by a physician and, and cleared uh, for vigorous exercise. That being said, at a broader level, um, the greater risk to your health is just remaining sedentary and, and staying on the couch. So uh, even a single weekly bout of high intensity exercise is, is good overall. When it comes to specifics, where the title of the book, The One Minute Workout, comes from, that's from research we've done in our laboratory where we've used as little as three 20-second hard bursts of exercise. Uh, Sometimes that's been on a bike. A recent study used stair climbing. And so start to finish, it's about a 10-minute time commitment with a little bit of warm-up, cool down, and some recovery in between. But the workout itself is only one minute of very vigorous exercise. And when we've had people do that three times a week, so that's only three minutes of very vigorous exercise within a 30-minute total time commitment each week, We've compared that to a group that was basically doing the public health guidelines of 150 minutes per week of more traditional exercise. And yet after several months of training, we see on average the same improvement in cardiorespiratory fitness, the same improvement in health-related markers such as insulin sensitivity or how well you control your blood sugar and even changes in their muscles. So we take biopsies and we look at mitochondrial content. Uh, And so even though there's a five-fold difference there in time commitment and total exercise, uh, the interval exercise induces very similar adaptations. And, And so again, that would sort of be the the lowest protocol uh, we've tested. There's some work out of Europe that is used uh, as low as uh, two 20-second efforts. Clearly, you're starting to, to scrape the bottom there a little bit in For terms sure. of the, uh, the, the, the volume of exercise. And again, at the end of the day, there's no free lunch. If you want the benefits of short burst exercise, you need to go hard. Uh, and that can be very uncomfortable and demanding, and it's clearly not suited for everyone, we wouldn't suggest that someone who's very sedentary would suddenly just, uh, you know, start sprinting their hearts out to uh, to try and boost their fitness. You got to be smart. Absolutely, and I would I would say that even in clinical practice, I mean, people who are extremely unfit, it's almost like uh, the brain or you know they're sort of self regulated. They can only push themselves so hard. And I, I'm, I'm amazed that when people come back with doing high, you know, hit training, um, how their motivation starts to change. You know, they're able to accomplish these short. Um, bursts, they, they start to feel better, the time commitment is shorter. Um, so I'm blown away in terms of whether it's, you know, obese, sedentary, um, dyslipidemic, etc. that just the compliance starts to go up and people who perhaps didn't even think they liked exercise, now all of a sudden there seems to be a bit more buy-in. Is that something that you guys have, have seen in some of the studies or... Yeah, I, I think so. And, you know, going back to the psychology of it, and again, I'm not a psychologist, but I, I ref, you know, we talked to a few experts in the book, including Dr. Mary Jung, who's out at UBC. And, you know, she makes the insightful point that let, let's reframe the message here. For a lot of people, if they can't do continuous exercise, even at a relatively low intensity for half an hour, uh, they feel like a failure. They're like, oh my God, I can't even get that. But Mary's point is, wait a minute, uh, do some exercise, take a break and and repeat it. You know, suddenly celebrate yourself for being an interval tra- Trainer. And going back to the classic um, cardiac rehabilitation uh, work, uh, it was recognized that the capacity of these individuals to do sustained continuous exercise is very, very low. And so just getting through their activities of daily living, it's basically interval exercise. They will walk for a little bit and then huff and puff, take a break, and then they'll they'll do it again. So sometimes it's this idea of reframing the message and how we how we look at things. And you're right. One thing with interval training, it boosts fitness relatively quickly. And so there's a school of thought that if you get that rapid boost in cardiorespiratory fitness, perhaps then other types of exercise are deemed less unpleasant. And you might be more um, motivated, for example, to take the stairs at work because you're feeling better about yourself because you've got that quick boost in your fitness. Absolutely. And you mentioned in your book as well, this, uh, you know, hits ability on the longevity side, this what we call the exercise factor, the myokines, exerkines, Mark Tornopolsky's work there at McMaster as well. Can you can you touch base on that? Because I know a lot of my clients uh, are very interested on this sort of longevity side of things with HIT training. Yeah, you know, Mark's work, and uh, you know, it's been a, a holy grail for 50 or 60 years trying to identify what we call the exercise uh, factor or, um, you know, to put in modern day uh, parlance or context, it's, you know, 
can we individualize exercise prescription? And obviously it's a very different um, situation, but for an, an individual who has cancer, uh, as part of their initial diagnosis, one of the things uh, an oncologist will typically do is biopsy a, t- a tumor and identify its its biology. And they will say, okay, based on uh, this fingerprint, this cancer signature, we know that this approach is likely to be best in terms of radiation or chemotherapy, these specific uh, drugs. We're nowhere near that in exercise, but there's ongoing research that seeks to identify these chemical signatures or metabolic fingerprints. So you can imagine you give a saliva sample or maybe a blood sample, and based on your chemical uh, fingerprint, uh, we'll get better at saying, you know what, uh, based on this fingerprint, we know that this type of exercise prescription is more likely for you. Maybe you'll benefit more from the traditional endurance approach, or maybe uh, interval training is is better uh, for you. So, so that's one element of this whole idea of uh, individualiz- individualized exercise size prescription. The other is trying to actually identify these factors that uh, float through the blood. You know, you can think of exercise, exercise, uh, a, a bit like hormones in that they're released from one part of the body and they travel to these distant target tissues and exert their effects. And Mark Tarnopolsky has done some fascinating research uh, with these pole gamma mice. And these are just mice that are, are genetically engineered uh, to have advanced aging. And what he's shown is that simply by exercising these animals, they essentially revert back to control mice and they look very similar to normal wild type uh, mice. Whereas the pole gamma mice, you know, they, they get decrepit, uh, their skin shrivels up, uh, they lose their hair, it grays. Simply by exercising, much of that was uh, reversed or, or, or abolished. And so Mark is trying to identify then these exerkines, which are these systematic or systemic factors that are released in response to exercise that induce these desirable effects um, in other parts of, of the body, because we really don't have a good handle on uh, what is causing that, you know, to bring it back to uh, exercise and and aging and potentially brain health. You know, we know we are learning more about the potential for exercise to reduce risk of uh, dementia and other uh, neurological uh, conditions. Clearly, this must be related somehow to effects of exercise on factors that might uh, migrate to the brain. You know, people may hear of a BDNF and there's, you know, these other factors that are getting a lot of attention right now. And I think we have a lot to learn, but it makes for very exciting times in terms of trying to come up with what specific exercise types and dosages are best uh, for specific conditions, uh, including trying to reverse the effects of aging. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like obviously the movement towards personalized medicine and personalized nutrition, this idea of personalized exercise just uh, really fits the bill in terms of being able to provide some efficiency with getting people to their goals uh, in the, the quickest possible route. So shifting gears just a little bit here, we have a lot of more you know elite athletes or weekend warriors really pushing themselves who might, uh, you know, when they engage in interval training are probably pushing it to that nth degree. Now on the overtraining side of things or pushing themselves uh-huh. overreaching, are there any um, you know blood markers that in a, in a clinical setting that you would you would look at in terms of being able to assess if athletes are, are getting into that uh, – that red zone? Yeah, obviously it's a bit of a nebulous concept, this whole idea of overreaching and overtraining. It's clearly a real phenomenon, but how we assess and diagnose it is is quite challenging. Um, you know, I, I think things like resting heart rates can still be very effective. You know, I'm talking here uh, waking heart rates, um, if, if that's elevated compared to uh, c- normal. Uh, I think as a practical standpoint, that's probably one of the best markers you know, I think you can do some hand waving around some markers like glutamine and things like that, but I, I don't think there's strong evidence uh, for for that. You know, sometimes people say, well, uh, high intensity interval training it's going to induce overtraining. Personally, I think overtraining is more related to total volume as opposed to intensity uh, per se. Um, you know, big picture, elite coaches and athletes are still generally going to recommend about an 80-20 split in terms of traditional uh, base aerobic, traditional endurance type training versus high intensity uh, intervals. Uh, but if you're certainly a time pressed athlete, I think you want to maintain uh, intensity and, and cut back on on volume. And I think in general, if an athlete is concerned or there's a risk for overtraining there, uh, cut, cutting back on volume is is a good strategy. You know, I. I've worked with enough, I've had graduate students, you know, I had a graduate student who was an elite cyclist and, you know, she would go out for the 120 kilometer recovery ride after a very hard day (laughs) before. And I would say, 
why are you doing that? <laughs> you know, she says, well, that's because everyone, everyone does that. But, uh, exactly. you know, and so I can talk phys- physiology all day, of course, and give lots of physiology reasons why an athlete may not want to do that. But it comes back to this whole idea of if an athlete thinks uh, in their head that that's very, very important, then they should probably be, be doing that. And, you know, there's, there's classic, there's a classic study out of Dave Costell's lab from Ball State, who is uh, a very good exercise physiologist and an elite masters, uh, swim coach. And he had athletes one year, uh, cause swimmers obviously are, you know, notorious for very high volume training, despite these very short events, typically, um, you know, they may swim 50,000 meters a week, uh, for, for events. And in the study, they basically were taking national collegiate swimmers and one group did their normal training which was just enormous training volumes and the other group cut their overall training volume in half and at the end of the competitive season there was no real differences between the groups and and so it called into this called into question why athletes do so much of this volume based training you know clearly it's, it's important in some regards, uh, you know, cyclists will talk about time in the saddle and there's lots of other things aside from just muscle and cardiovascular physiology that's important, you know, maybe tendon remodeling, maybe just the mental fortitude of spending that time in the bike, uh, is important, uh, for some events like rowing and swimming, there's more feel for the water. And so arguably that comes into play. But as a general blanket statement, I I think a number of endurance athletes do too much of just the high volume stuff just because, uh, as opposed to uh, a a very systematic or legitimate reason for, for, uh, for doing it. Yeah, that's definitely what I see in my practice with with the endurance crowd as well. That just idea of volume and pushing volume all the time rather than these uh, intensity is definitely one of those areas that can push into the overtraining um, red zone. Now, wrapping things up, I want to make sure we uh, respect your time here, uh, Martin. Now, where do you see the evolution of, of HIT training? Is it is it in what you just mentioned there in terms of being able to accomplish things at an elite level in, in half the time as, as previous? Um, where's the research going at the moment? Yeah, pro- I guess, you know, uh, fundamentally, I- I'm interested in three things, right? That's basic mechanisms, that's applied human performance, and that's health-related application. And so I think you can envision those as three overlapping circles. And I think there's going to be continued research in all of those areas. Uh, one basic physiological mechanisms, we still have a lot to learn. So it's fine to say that short, hard intervals boost cardiorespiratory fitness and improve VO2 max to the same extent as traditional exercise. Uh, But why? Because if you think of the underlying physiology there, uh, the traditional idea is the heart gets bigger and the left ventricular volume gets bigger because you're fluxing large amounts of blood through the heart for a prolonged period of time. When you do some short, hard intervals, that physiological stress is very different. And so let's, you know, try and figure out the basic physiological remodeling there. From a performance standpoint, um, there is a lot to learn in terms of the specific interval training protocols that are most beneficial uh, for athletes. I think without question, there's good evidence to show that intervals can boost performance, but we still have a lot to learn in terms of optimizing exercise prescription. And you can have lots of arguments about, you know, whether it's three or five zone training, how much time you should spend in each, but I don't think we have a, a, a ton of good evidence uh, around that. And I think probably most importantly from a public health perspective, it's interval training uh, for health. Uh, and you know, when I look at the state of the literature, I'll, I'll often borrow an example from the pharmaceutical industry and sort of frame it as the public health guidelines are a bit like the long established drug of choice on the market. There's uh, lots of uh, epidemiological evidence to support it and show that, for example, if people do uh, you know, this much exercise, 150 minutes a week of exercise, their risk of dying is lower and their risk of developing many different chronic diseases is lower. And I'm often asked, you know, why isn't, why aren't intervals in the public health guidelines? And the simple answer is we don't have the evidence that we would need uh, to get them there. You know, there are no large scale randomized clinical trials showing that when people do this type of interval exercise, uh, they die less or they die less compared to the traditional uh, approach. And so coming back to that pharmaceutical analogy, I I think there's lots of uh, emerging evidence uh, showing that, uh, you know, interval exercise is very, 
uh, effective in these early phase trials, but we really need these larger scale randomized clinical trials to make systematic head-to-head comparisons in large groups of people with very robust health outcome uh, markers uh, over different uh, ages. I think the uh, the research will move uh, in, in, in that direction, and that will be extremely beneficial in terms of trying to, uh, you know, uh, give some uh, perspective to the best types of interval approaches for specific conditions uh, at, uh, at various age points. Fantastic, Martin. Uh, last question here for you. Your morning routine, what does that look like? Getting up in the morning, are you a coffee guy? How does that, uh, how does that play out? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, first thing I do is, uh, my dog and I have this little thing where I, you know, I feed the dog first thing. She gets a little, uh, little treat. Uh, I am a coffee guy. Um, I have been married for almost 20 years and, uh, almost every day for 20 years I've, uh, I've got my wife uh, a coffee. So that's usually how the day starts. Uh, and then I typically read three, three newspapers a day. One of the first things I do is read the Hamilton spectator, uh, on my iPad and then, uh, invariably the email start and things like that. But it is a, at least during the week, it's a, it's a fairly set routine and, uh, that's basically how my day starts. Fantastic. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time out here, uh, Martin, today. Uh, your book, The One Minute Workout, is, is, is phenomenal. I mean, it's obviously some deep insights into all the aspects of HIT training, wonderful protocols, and even some great nutrition uh, tips from, from yourself and Stu Phillips over there at McMaster. Uh, where can people pick up the book? Where can people keep uh, track of what you're doing in terms of research and work? Uh, yeah, the book is available both online and in store from uh, major booksellers everywhere. As you noted, it's peg- published by uh, Penguin Random House. Uh, and uh, on Twitter, they can find me at, at Gabala M. Uh, I'm not as uh, active as some of uh, my colleagues, but I'm uh, increasingly uh, being a little bit more active on, on Twitter as well. Fantastic. Well, I think the book should be sort of mandatory reading for all doctors and nutritionists and healthcare providers.